Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Ashish, Vice President with Zydus. And at the outset, I thank Mumbai Hematology Group for giving Zydus this opportunity to collaborate for today's webinar on mental cell lymphoma. While COVID has played havoc across the world, but it has surely pushed everyone to adapt digitalization and opening opportunity to have the experts from across the globe to connect with as many clinicians as possible. And today I welcome our eminent guest speaker for today, Dr. Martin. Who have joined us? Who will join us from uh, Munich, Germany, in some time? Uh, a very warm welcome to our chief guest, Padam Shri, Dr. Pankaj Shah. We also have a very august group of Indian faculties as discussant for this important topic, and I also welcome the virtual delegates who have joined us from for today's important discussion from not just India but from many other countries. Now, a special welcome to the person who has got everyone together for today's webinar, Professor Dr. M. B. Agarwal. He will also moderate today's discussion. I have the privilege today to introduce Sir, though Sir needs no introduction. Sir is presently the head of the Department of Hematology at the Bombay Hospital Institute of Medical Sciences at Mumbai. He also is the Director of Hematology Center located at Dada, Mumbai. He also acts as a consultant hematologist at a number of hospitals in Mumbai, including the Lilavati Hospital in Breach Candy. Sir has held a number of important positions, some of which are past president Indian Society of Hematology and Transfusion Medicine, uh, president of Mumbai Science. Hematology Group. He has been the part of selection committee of Department of Pathology at the Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. Sir's career spanned over four decades has not just helped patients in India get better, but has also inspired many young clinicians to take up hematology and has always taken lead to disseminate hematology updates by bringing the eminent and expert group together like today. Thank you for all your efforts, sir. Over to you, sir, to take the program forward. Thank you, Mr. Ashish Kumar. So good morning to one and all. Today, our guest speaker is Dr. Martin Drelling from Germany. He's going to speak to us on mental cell lymphoma. This webinar is brought to you by Mumbai Hematology Group, supported by Zydus, managed by MySidus. I thank Mr. Ashish Kumar and his team from Zydus, Mr. Rajesh Kalpesh and their team from Mice Ideas, Executive Committee of Mumbai Hematology Group, the Chief Guest Dr. Pankaj Bhai from Ahmedabad, our guest speaker Dr. Martin Drelik from Germany, all our discussants who are eminent hematologists and medical oncologists and new participants for sparing your Sunday morning. Coming Saturday, 12th Feb, 7 p.m., we have Dr. Samir Tulpale from Mumbai speaking to us on myelofibrosis. Next day morning, Sunday, 13th of Feb, 11.30, we have Lieutenant General Dr. Velu Nair speaking to us on recent advances in the landscape of venous thrombosis. Our discussions today include a galaxy of very, very important metallurgists and hemato-oncologists. All of you know them very well. To complete the formality, we have Dr. Bahati from Pune, Dr. Abhishek Kakru from Ahmedabad, Dr. Akanksha Garg from Ahmedabad, Dr. Amit Khurana from Surat, Dr. Aniket Mohite from Kolapur, Dr. Ankit Riyani from Ahmedabad, Dr. Bhausai Bagal from Mumbai, Dr. Deepankar Lucknow, Dr. Kunga Delhi, Dr. Kripa Bajaj Hyderabad, Dr. Lalit Mohan Sharma Jaipur, Dr. Prashant Abhi Mangaluru, Colonel Dr. Rajan Kapoor Kolkata, Dr. Riya Balari Nagpur, Dr. Samir Malinkari Pune, Dr. S.P. Varma, Lucknow, Dr. Sharad Damodar, Bangalore, Dr. Shilpa Gupta, Mumbai, Dr. Srinath Shirsagar, Mumbai, and Dr. Vivek Radhakrishnan, Kolkata. Our Sunday pictorial quiz. Today, we'll show you two pictures. They belong to a 10-year-old girl who was admitted with skin patches of three days duration. So you have to diagnose this condition and email your answer to mbagarwal1 at gmail.com. The one who gives the correct diagnosis, we will tell their names and the one who is fastest finger first will be the winner. 10 year old girl, skin patches, three days. I'll show you two pictures. This is one of the pictures.
And that's the second picture. So email your diagnosis to this email ID, mbagarwal1 at gmail.com. Whoever gives the complete diagnosis and is first in sending the email is the winner. Now go to the case of the week. A 78 year old gentleman from Mumbai, fever, loss of weight, fatigue, about five weeks duration. A lot of comorbidities, IHD, HTN, type 2 diabetes, COPD, dyslipidemia. LVEF was 25%. X-ray chest showed an enlarged cardiac silhouette. CT scan showed a large volume pericardial effusion. Almost a liter of fluid was drained. However, the fluid rapidly filled up again, needing a pericardial window. The gene expert from the fluid for tuberculosis was negative. It's a closer view of the CT scan showing you the large pericardial effusion. And that's the PET scan showing you an enlarged cardiac silhouette due to the pericardial effusion with no FDG avid mass or lymph node anywhere. That's the cytology which showed large atypical lymphoid cells with irregular nuclear membrane, vesicular chromatin, multiple prominent nuclei, and ample basophilic cytoplasm. The cells are positive for 45, 30, 138. Negative for 20, 79A, PAX5, 3, 5, ALK1, and EBER. A flow done showed Cells were positive for CD38 bright, 138, HLADR 45, negative for 19, 56, and both surface and cytoplasmic immunoglobulins. Just a closer look at the cytology, and I'm sorry for a little blurred picture. That's the flow. These are the cells, reddish purple, showing high forward scatter and bright CD38 expression. A diagnosis of primary effusion lymphoma was made. HIV was negative. Blood was negative for EB virus and HHV8 by PCR. Because of the comorbidities, including the cardiac problem and the LV ejection fraction being so poor, he was declared unfit for the job. Literature search showed anecdotal reports of daratumumab used for CD38 positive primary fusion lymphoma with good success. Patient was given dara monotherapy in the dose of 16 mg per kg per day, once a week for two months, followed by once in two weeks for four months. And now he's on once a month maintenance. He's with us for the last 14 months. A repeat pet after four months showed good response with marked reduction in the pericardial effusion. There's been no recurrence of effusion till date. That is the original cardiac silhouette, and that's the present one. And that was the after four months. I'm sorry. This publication in New England Journal of Medicine, 2018, DARA for primary effusion lymphoma. That's a case report, DARA, as the first-line therapy for primary effusion lymphoma. Primary effusion lymphoma collects in various body cavities. This is a large study in HIV negative, pleural effusion, either side, shown in blue, pericardial effusion, ascites, or multiple sites involved, with no mass, no extra cavitative lesions. This is published in Blood Advances 2020. That's the immunophenotyping. 
सी डी फोर्टी फाइव थर्टी एट सेवेंटी वन फोर्टी फोर आर ओ एच एल ई डी आर थर्टी साइटोप्लाज्मिक लेमडा सेवन फोर ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी थ्री सरफेस लेमडा अगेन पब्लिश इन प्लेट टू थाउजेंड एटीन As the molecular biology of this disease, usually HHV8 infected B cells acquire the characteristic neoplastic changes. These changes lead to immune evasion, drug resistance, anti-apoptosis, cell cycle progression, and cytokine stabilization. So that was the case of the week, and now it's my privilege to introduce the guest speaker of the day, who is going to inaugurate our webinar, and that's none other than Pankaj Bai, Padmasri Pankaj Bai from Ahmedabad. He needs no introduction. He is, as everybody says, Bhishma Pitama of Hematology and Medical Oncology in India. He has blessed us by his kind presence at a number of occasions in the last 30 years. And during these two years of pandemic, he has been a part of our webinars at multiple occasions. As Vice President, Sadhvichar Parivar, Vice President, Gujarat Cancer Society, Professor Emeritus, Medical Oncology GCR Ahmedabad, Consultant Medical Oncology Zaiza Hospital Ahmedabad. He began his illustrious career in 1973, now spanning over five glittering decades of hard work and dedication. He began his career as a nuclear medicine physician, went to Germany to get trained in chemotherapy way back in 1973. Under his leadership for the first time in GCR, a Department of Medical Oncology was added to the Surgical Oncology and Radio Oncology. It was his vision with which a separate pediatric oncology center was created in 1992, the first of its kind in India. Once again, it was his vision that gave birth to BMT unit in GCRI in 2002. It is to his credit that a community oncology center was developed at Vasna and later Madan Mohan Raman Lal Urban Health Center was developed. But to see him, GCRI had its own website in 1994 and a telemedical center, computerization, and a paperless office. Today, as was mentioned, he is Padma Shri Dr. Pankaj Bai, and he is a pillar of Zaidus Cancer Center. He was honored with the prestigious Dr. B. C. Roy Award, the highest award in the field of medical education, by the President of India, Her Excellency Shrimati Pratibha Patil. I am absolutely honored by his kind presence today. I request him to inaugurate our webinar and give some words of wisdom. Thank you, Professor Agarwal. You are always, uh, uh, I think, so partial to me and puts lots of good words for me. Look at one thing which I can say that I had a good fortune to observe from 73 February onwards till today the progress in clinical hematology and oncology. And what I have seen that the contribution of the Mumbai Hematology Group under its various leaders. But mainly, Doctor M. B. Agarwal has made a probably a open hematology university for the world. It is the vision of our Prime Minister to convert India into digital India. And if somebody is to be honored for this particular aspect in medical education, I am not much aware about the other superficiality, but I am sure it is. Dr. M. B. Agarwal, who should be put number one for converting medical education on a digital platform in hematology in the country, and helping lots of students and the people like me across India and across the world, because many of the participants are from the neighboring country also. He is you are exposing us to the. Faculty across the world, the few people we will never able to meet them on a normal platform in India. You have brought them to us. Those friends who have enjoyed the fruits of this particular open university of hematology by Agarwal and his team, those who are going to join the medical oncology, clinical hematology, pediatric oncology. This year or last two years, start using this platform every weekend. It is a weekend university 
on hematology. Dear friends, about 25, 6,000 super specialty seats are available. Out of that, there are about less than 200 seats for this hematology associated super specialty. And every year, this university can get at least 300 new entrants to learn hematology. Yesterday, the nation celebrated Vasant Panchmi. It is the occasion of welcoming spring, but it is equally known as a Gnan Panchmi. And when I have to reply to M.B. Agarwal on his request to be part of this particular webinar, I said that I will be part of your Gnana Yagna. And on Gnana Panchmi yesterday, and today there is a Gnana Yagna by Dr. Agarwal. You see that the participant across the country, across the city, and he, he find out the best of them, whatever we, as a local person, I was not way, knowing about my own student, Dr. Kukru. I, I came to know about the depth of his knowledge in one of his presentation before a month or so in the webinar organized by Dr. M. B. Agarwal. Friends, such webinars and such activity to do it constantly on a regular way with the innovative ideas, you see, that the our guest speaker is going to join by 11.45. And during, during this 15 minutes, this professor has not lost or wasted a single minute. Two queries and one case report, very clinical uh, interest to all of us has been shown. I am a big promoter of it, this particular uh, Gnani Yagna. Unfortunately, in last uh, three, four months, I was not very regular attending it, but those who cannot attend, at least part of it is available on the website. And this is another beauty of this virtual medical platform, that if you have missed the lecture, you can go to the website of uh, Mumbai Metallurgy Group or the website of the uh, Dr. Rajesh Sharma, Mr. Rajesh Sharma, and you find everything, everything. Many times I have to go to assess all those things to find out the best of hematology at present, which you may not find in the up-to-date, but you will always find something in the webinar arranged by our good friend, Dr. M.B. Agarwal. Uh, there are lymphoma, whenever I think of lymphoma, the first my exposure to real world of academics in lymphoma was I have to accompany one of the industrialists of Ahmedabad to Bombay. He was diagnosed at that time in 1976, angioimmunoblastic lymphadenopathy. And we started with the simple treatment at that time available, CHOP. Repapot was there. The, I asked him whether we should stop the treatment because he has responded very well to CHOP. At that time, we have started understanding the lymphoma. And from morphology to immunophenotypy, we have not reached the genetic and molecular aspect of lymphoma at that time. Now in 2020-22, we have about 80 different lymphomas at 2WHO. About 10 to 15 are a different distinct type with a different way of treating them or the individually we have to define it and can treat with a precision medicine the world which are using nowadays. Dr. Akarwal and your team, and I invite all those who are going to appear for the NIT and going to take up the hematology as the super speciality, start joining this webinar because it is, even though after the COVID is over, I'm sure this particular activity will go on on a two platform. Because previously also Dr. Agarwal used to have one mega event every month almost for the last five, six years. And if after COVID it is going to cut in, but the virtual platform is going to stay. At the end, let me share with you 
nature is mourning uh, we have lost our bharat ratna lata mangeshkar today her voice will remain forever in the world on a digital platform i may not say but the digital platform which is used for the hematology education by dr agarwal and the team is going to stay as a part of a education tool for at least few years to come for all our student and the practitioner like me congratulations dr agarwal and your team and best wishes for this webinar thank you thank you pankaj bhai for your kind words in inaugurating this webinar uh, you have been very kind to us and to me uh, i'll share my screen to introduce our today's guest speaker so friends today we have a fantastic personality dr martin drilling from munich germany all of you if you have anything to do with lymphoma especially mental cell lymphoma know his name for many many decades i have heard him in multiple meetings in europe and us and it has been extremely impressive to meet this thorough gentleman to complete the formalities of introducing him to our young audience we have today participation from 15 countries and half of them are trainees and fellows and others of course the senior faculty from hematology and medical oncology dr martin drilling is professor of medicine head lymphoma program medical clinic 3 lmu university hospital munich germany he studied human medicine at the henrik and university of dusseldorf the justice libeck university jesen the abahard karls university tubingen and the julius maximilian university wurzburg after graduation 87 he began his internship at the university hospital bonn in 1988 1990 he received his doctorate during the same year he moved to munster where he worked first at clemens hospital affiliate of university hospital munster he then undertook hematology and oncology research from 1992 to 1995 at the university of chicago us he returned to germany and completed his fellowship at the university hospital gottingen and at the universe at the hospital of the ludwig maximilian university munich where he completed his boarding exam in 1998 In 2001, he habilitated on molecular genetics and fundamental characterization of the tumor suppressor region of the chromosomal band 9p21 in hematological cell lines, and lymphomas and leukemias, and was appointed as a senior physician a year later. In October 2007, he received the call to the W2 profession prof professorship, immunotherapy and molecular biology of the Ludwig. Maximilian University Hospital in Munich. Currently, he oversees the lymphoma program at the Medical Department Three at the M uh, L M U University Hospital, Munich, Germany. His clinical research focuses on the development and application of novel therapeutic approaches, including immunotherapeutic approaches for patients of malignant lymphomas, especially indolent lymphoma, and most specifically mental cell lymphoma. He coordinates the European M C L network. is president elect of the german lymphoma alliance is a member of various medical societies he sits among others on the board of the european hematology association today he is going to give his lecture on advances in mental cell lymphoma and over to sir for his lecture well thank you so much for this kind invitation and i really have to apologize for the complicated cv um reason is that about 100 years ago there was not just one germany but 300 something kingdoms uh, well 150 years ago to be honest um and at that time if you wanted to attract some people uh, to your kingdom your small kingdom what did you do you established a university and this is why all major german universities are in fact in smaller cities just because of this tradition having said that 
today I would like to share with you some insights into the treatment of Montessor lymphoma, which is a re rather rare disease, have to admit. And therefore, we really uh, joined forces in Europe to work together on this subject uh, to get really meaningful results. And uh, during the last, uh, I would say, 20 years or so, we really made some advantage. Uh, and I'm happy to, to present you an update. In fact, I have been uh, at uh, the Mumbai meeting already, well, probably more than 10 years ago. So this time, unfortunately, only virtual but I will give my best. Uh, so um, first of all, um, uh, these are my disclosures and who are uh, for the ones who are not interested in uh, disclosures, this is a view out of my window right now. And if you are interested in uh, our initiative against bureaucracy in clinical trials, which is probably an international uh, theme, please go to this website and, and support our initiative. Okay. So this is what I'm going to tell you. I will essentially focus on three parts. I will start very shortly with the molecular pathogenesis of the disease and really focusing on the one, uh, well, on the aspects which are clinically relevant. I will then give a short overview of what I do think is current standard of care in first line of Montacell, and then move on to targeted therapies, which will take over I would say during the next five years or so. And uh, really the front runner of all this are the BTKs, the Brutons tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So while the disease has a typical clinical uh, presentation, mostly elderly male, median age is probably somewhere between 60 to 70. Um, uh, and um, in parts, indolent in parts, aggressive. So the question is, how do we split mantle cell lymphoma according to these features? Well, the WHO, what they do is, in fact, based on the different molecular uh, pathogenesis, and I, I'm not going into details, um, uh, they um, split between the leukemic non-nodal, the CLL-like uh, features, and the nodal ones. And I should emphasize that all of these do have a cyclin D1 overexpression. So cyclin D1 overexpression is really the diagnostic feature. If you're not detecting cyclin D1 overexpression, it's not a mantle cell lymphoma, full stop. Other way around, if you are not uh, defining cyclin D1 expression, you're going to miss two thirds of the disease. So this is really critical. Now, Having said, with all these different subtypes of mantle cell lymphoma, um, clinical-wise, we probably should split like that, because this to the left side is probably more resembling indolent lymphoma, uh, independent whether it's nodal or CLL kind of. And if there are additional one or three risk factors, and which are these? These are the blastoid variants, so high aggressively cytomorphology, or high ki 67 which is cell proliferation, or MIP-1 known internationally, above 30%, this is high risk, or P53 uh, um, mutation, as illustrated here, then you have an aggressive disease. And then the clinical course is totally different, as illustrated here. This is the, let's say, classical mantle cell lymphoma, and this is about... Um, 60 to 70% of the cases, two thirds. And you say after 10 years, the majority of patients is still fine. Whereas the median overall survival in the aggressive uh, subtype, again, one third is only four years. So this is important to understand. So therefore, uh, if a patient shows up in our clinics with the diagnostics of mantle cell lymphoma, First of all, check cyclin D1 overexpression. Is it really mantle cell lymphoma? And secondly, is this high or low risk? Why is that? Because we try to um, adapt treatment according to this risk profile. And this is illustrated here. So I have to admit, uh, MIPI, the old fashioned clinical factors, still play a role. C stands for ki 67 so this is here, ESP53. And accordingly, we uh, you know, divide mantle cell lymphoma in different, let's say, flavors. And if it's an indolent lymphoma with low tumor burden, you just watch and wait. 
and only if there's high tumor burden then you start and probably you're pretty well off with our current standard of care which is our chemotherapy and then if it's high risk then you probably have to move on to probably combinations at least this is what we currently know um, chemo plus targeted therapy but this may change quickly so if I'm talking about chemotherapy, what are the chemotherapy standards in mantle cell lymphoma? And these are the European guidelines. Partially they're outdated, but some uh, aspects are still very much up to date. And our current standard of care in younger patients has, again, three parts. Uh, and that is uh, you start with inside air being containing induction. You go on for dose intensification and the majority Colleagues now worldwide prefer autologous transplant over HIPCVAT, and uh, the explanation is rather simple: its uh, toxicity is lower. And then finally, you add rituximab maintenance. And just to illustrate, we have an update on the simple substitution of CHOP, which had been already mentioned uh, by Dr. Shaw. Um, and we use it now since uh, 50 years, essentially. Um, just a simple substitution of three cycles are chopped by RDHEP. Uh, and you're quite familiar with this old fashioned uh, regimen as well. And you see there's a huge benefit in progression free survival, even after 10, 15 years, in the range of 20, 25%. So, really clinically relevant. And now we have also significant overall survival differences become smaller. Now they're only in the range of 5 to 10 percent, but the, this difference goes all through. And this is, of course, highly significant. So um, if you don't do it in first line, you will never catch up with whatever kind of salvage. What about autologous transplant? Well, after a follow up of 16 years, we finally were able to detect the benefit not only on, on PFS, which is major, here is um, R plus autologous transplant in comparison to uh, standard chemotherapy only, but also overall survival. And you see, this is a somewhat doubling overall survival. However, I have to be honest. So the major difference is there in the subset of patients being treated with chemotherapy only, which is no more the standard. Nowadays, it's our chemo, and then there is only a minimal difference. So we have probably in future times to challenge autologous again. What is standard of care for the majority of patients? And this is our chemo plus our maintenance for everyone. And just to illustrate that, CHOP has been already mentioned, and RCHOP is still standard of care in a lot of B cell lymphoma. And in this randomized study, a simple thing was done vincristine was uh, substituted by bortezomib. Small intervention. And what is the outcome? And this is here a major benefit on progression free survival. Again, look at that 25%. And after long follow-up, also a huge difference in overall survival. So therefore, via cap formally is currently the standard of care in elderly patients. Now, having said that, this is induction. What about maintenance? I told you already in younger patients, maintenance is part of standard of care based on our, uh, the data of our French colleagues, the Lima trial. We also investigated uh, this approach in, young, uh, in, in elderly patients. And this is the long-term follow-up of our study randomized trial. And look at that. Here, even 25, 30% benefit of PFS for uh, our maintenance. And even overall survival benefit of 20%. Now, 20%, can you imagine of any intervention which improves overall survival by 20% in any kind of uh, hematological or oncological disease? I'm heme -onc both. So this is really, uh, you know, a mind setter. And therefore, if you think about mantle cell lymphoma, think about maintenance. Now, it has been disputed 
long time that this only works of the R chop. But now we have some updated uh, US data with Bender Mustin. And Bender Mustin is more or less the inofficial standard of care in elderly patients, which are vulnerable, have comorbidities, and so on. And it was always argued R maintenance does not work after Bender Mustin. Well, it does. And here you see uh, the evaluation of 1,200 patients treated first line with either r -chop plus minus maintenance. And these are the brownish curves and a major benefit of maintenance. But the same holds up for Bendamastin as illustrated here. Really a benefit of 25%. And that also uh, corresponds into a significant improvement of overall survival in this epidemiological study uh, in the range of 50%. So for me, yes, based on these data, our maintenance is standard of care after whatever kind of induction. Now, that is the current status. Uh, what about the targeted approaches? Everyone is talking about targeted approaches, but what do they really deliver? First of all, uh, and this illustrated here, the poor performers remain the poor performers. Blastoid uh, um, histology only achieves a duration of remission in the range of five months. However, if you compare that to what you achieve with standard chemotherapy, and these are the data of our Italian colleagues in young patients where you can do anything, even uh, the miracle combination Arbeck, Benda, Cytarabine, established by our Italian colleagues, you see that ibrutinib uh, results in a significantly improved uh, overall survival, or this is PFS, uh, first of all, uh, in the early relapses. So patients relapsing after two years, they benefit uh, from switching from chemo to targeted approaches. No difference in the late uh, responders and the same holds up for overall survival. And therefore, nowadays, targeted approaches are standard of care in first relapse, in early relapses, definitely. Now, if we're considering that, we're also considering to move that first line. And this is, let's say, the first way for studies, I would say, where targeted approaches plus chemo are being tested. And one of them has been just presented, uh, well, essentially four weeks ago at ASH. And this is a um, combination of R-square adding to chemotherapy. What about rituximab lenalidomide, uh, its efficacy on its own? Our US colleagues in New York, while well, medical school tested that, and um, they treated first-line patients, uh, and they added also maintenance. And you see PFS is pretty impressive. Very small study, not even 40 patients, but still, you know, median PFS in the range of, of five years or so. Um, well, that's true. It's fine, but it's mostly, you have a closer, have to have a close look at the series, mostly in the landmark to cell lymphoma. And uh, still there is something in it. So we thought, let's test it as intensified maintenance. And this is a, this randomized study about with uh, 600 patients being included, where we randomized simple rituximab maintenance for two years versus R square. First of all, toxicity. Um, there was a slight pronounced neutropenia. Um, and infections were slightly increased. Uh, I just would like to mention the point of secondary malignancies. There were cutaneous secondary uh, malignancies which required resection. But besides that, there was no difference uh, of secondary systemic malignancies. And again, the benefit is quite impressive. Look at that. Um, here we have really a benefit of 20%, which is huge. Not yet overall survival benefit. We probably have to wait uh, for another 10 years or so, but this is impressive. And so for me, formally, this is the new standard of care, or square in elderly patients, or let's say it would be, because everyone is waiting for this study, the SHINE trial, 
which is comparing a BR plus rituximab. I told you already, uh, this is somewhat the standard of care in elderly patients in Europe, adding rituximab. And um, this combination plus ibrutinib. I showed you the impressive data of BTK inhibitors in, in relapsed disease. So one may assume this is a, a significant study and it is a significant study. And we submitted the full protocol yesterday. These were the elderly patients. I should also mention, we also uh, investigate that in younger patients. Uh, this is our triangle trial, uh, which has recruited almost 900 patients. And there we compared, in fact, um, our current standard of care, cytarabine containing induction, autologous transplant plus R maintenance. And in the experimental arm, we substituted autologous transplant by ibrutinib in maintenance and induction. Now, um, autologous transplant is very efficient. It does prolong remissions, but it also uh, uh, induces long-term toxicity. So therefore, if this arm will be at least as good, this will become the new standard of care. And then you see uh, it's similar treatment in younger and older patients are chemo plus I. And I should mention this is just illustrating, this is really an international initiative. No one of us would be able to perform such a huge trial individually. It's really, you know, uh, recruiting all over Europe, including Israel. Now, this is the data you will probably um, uh, read uh, either later this year or next year. So the very near future. Um, but the, the second wave is already uh, going on, and that is a head-to-head -head comparison, chemo versus targeted approaches. And do we have any data on ibrutinib in first line? Yes, we have. And this is um, uh, a study which just recently has been published uh, in JCO, a combination of ibrutinib plus rituximab in first line of Montessor lymphoma. And the interesting thing about this study, if patients achieved an MRD negativity, treatment was stopped after 24 months. And let's have a look at the inclusion criteria. I already mentioned this was indolent Montessor lymphoma. So they excluded blastoid variants. They excluded cases with QI67 above uh, 30%. And they also excluded patients with large tumor bulk. So really indolent patients, you probably formally would more watch and wait, fair to say, but still outcome is quite impressive when you have a look at these data up to uh, three, four years. And this is the interesting message. Um, in, uh, in 19 patients, uh, this treatment was stopped. This is at least the status uh, at ICML. In JCO, you will see these numbers goes up. And at that time, only three patients uh, relapsed molecularly, not clinically. And now with a longer follow-up reported in JCO, I think there was only one patient relapsing. So showing this combined approach for limited time works. Now, this was indolent lymphoma. And if we would like to extend that to all flavors of mental cell lymphoma, we do what we always do in uh, uh, oncology. We go into combinations. And this is one trial combining bortezomib. I showed you already the promising data of bortezomib plus ibrutinib. And simple thing, uh, just combining these two approaches and this is interesting. You might say, well, this overall response uh, and the PFS might be not that great, but these were mostly high risk patients. And that is shown here um, in the bluish curve. And look at that. For the cases, um, high ki 67 you still come up with overall response rate of 80%. For the low-risk patients, it's 96%, so you can't top that. Same holds up for P53 and blastoid. So I think this is really the future uh, we are moving to. And of course, everyone's darling is um, this trial, the AIM trial, which was performed by the, our Australian colleagues, uh, which combines ibrutinib um, blocking 
let's say cell proliferation and at the same time targeting a cell death by blocking bcl2 with venetoclax and this is interesting because it's a very small study only two dozens of patients but it did include patients with p53 alterations and that is shown here um, these in black are the low risk patients and, and after two years still two-thirds of patients in remission small numbers so this is more a hypothesis generating trial still and the red curve is p53 and as you see uh, cases with p53 mutations have a pfs of uh, around 45 percent after two years now you say well this is not great Yes, it's not great, but it's better in comparison to whatever you achieve with a conventional chemotherapy where curves would just go down like that. So um, there is something in it and we have to consider how can we improve? And that's by Stephen Legoul, our French colleagues, uh, part of our European MCL network. Uh, they tested the triple combination. So ibrutinib, venetoclax, plus obinutuzumab, and they went to first-line treatment. And here, very small study, first-line only 15 patients, but PFS is great, overall survival, well, you can't top that one, obviously. Uh, um, uh, again, promising, but has to be confirmed. And this is going to be confirmed in our mcl 3 trial, where we just compare head-to-head -head this combination, ibrutinib, venetoclux, plus anti-CD20 antibody, to uh, the presumed new standard, which is bendamustine, rituximab, ibrutinib. And that is really the first challenge of chemotherapy by a non-chemo approach in a randomized fashion. Now, if we are moving BTK inhibits first line, what are we going to do next? And that's the challenge. These are uh, the initial uh, data being published by Peter Martin from New York. And you see this is the overall group that outcome is dismal. And, and this is the overall survival. So median overall survival is only in the range of five months or so. So desperate situation. So what can we achieve or how can we achieve long-term remissions uh, after BTK inhibitors? Well, the one uh, approach which has been established are CAR T cells. And that's illustrated here. It's rather complex, just to remind you, it takes a lot of infrastructure to really set this up, uh, a lot of interdisciplinary activities. Um, so does it really work in these desperate cases? Now we have uh, these phase two study um, presented by Michael Wong, and this was all patient who progressed after or under BTK inhibitor therapy. Um, and these patients did receive CAR T cells. And look at that duration of remission here after 24 months, two years again, we are more than half of patients are still in remission and similarly PFS. So this is the first approach which clearly achieves long-term remission. And therefore, this data set is very important because this is real life. One thing was selected studies, but this is real life. And uh, the American cohort being presented six weeks ago at ASH. And what you can see is really high risk patients, high ki 67 blasted variant, P53. It's always the same established risk factors, which will be also implemented in the new WHO classification. And you see here as well, uh, um, the majority of patients were BTKI refractory. What about response rate? Still 90%, 90%, 89, slightly lower than in the tri trial. And progression-free survival, well, these are early days, you know, follow up only a couple of months, but you see these uh, remissions seems to be ongoing, at least in half of the patients. Now, therefore, in the German uh, guidelines, we now established uh, or adopted all these uh, recommendations for the patients POT24, so the early relapses, BTK inhibitors, namely ibrutinib, is, is the front runner, whereas for the late relapses, and this is a, a chance to practice your German, at least for Dr. Shaw, um, 
uh, here you can see that you can uh, go for either way. Now, important is once you're failing ibrotinib, then the recommended uh, approach in our national guidelines are CAR T cells because so far they have been the only approach achieving long term remissions. Now, this and on purpose, I wrote, wrote 21. This was the status 21, but we have 22 now. And we have two approaches which surprisingly see, achieve similar results. And one is uh, the BTK, uh, sorry, the bispecific antibodies, which are, I, I would say, the small people's uh, CAR T cells, similar approach, adding um, an anti CD20 antibody. And you see all of these, or the vast majority of these patients did previously receive BTKI. And you know, the vast majority were refractory to the last treatment line. And look at that, response rates, quite convincingly, 80% response, um, complete metabolic remissions in two thirds. So this is quite striking, still short follow up. So we have to see whether these um, remissions are ongoing. What I can share with you, at least a few patients now have remissions uh, uh, out to two years and longer. And the other approach is uh, uh, the Loxo compound, Pyrtobrotinib, which is a non-covalent BTKI. So you might say, well, BTKI, Normally, one after another, it does not work. But there's something different for this one, because 90% of these patients previously received uh, another conventional BTKI. First of all, this was excellently tolerated. Only 1% stopped the treatment one tablet a day because of toxicities. And you see here you see the, the toxicities grade three, four, even grade two. This is all one digit frequency. So very well tolerated. And when it comes to duration of response, still you see uh, out to a year or so, this is where you can still evaluate uh, these patient numbers. Uh, the majority of patients is in remission. So based on these results, I, I think this is, uh, is going to be submitted to registration. And of course, to be honest, one pill a day is easier than the complex and expensive CAR T cells. So I, I think this will definitely um, you know, be in a standard approach after BTKI failure. Finally, so this is somewhat a look into the future. So this is how I envision let's say in five years from now, that we treat these patients. We, we still use the same um, stratifying of patients, I'm quite convinced. We will still watch and wait for low tumor load, low risk patients. But I think BTKI based on its efficacy will take over for low risk cases. I showed you some data. And for the high risk patients, I think uh, uh, this will be combination. And once this combination fails, this is the huge question mark, what will come after that? And I have no clue, very clearly been said. From now, uh, today, uh, I would say it's CAR T cells, but I showed you already two, three uh, additional approaches, which seems to be effective after BTKI. So, Treating relapsed mantle cell lymphoma will have to reinvestigate it all over. So here I'm at the end. I uh, really would um, tell you this is not, uh, you know, a one-man show, but this is really activity of uh, the whole group of European collaboration. I'm a strong believer in, in Europe. And these are the people who are uh, standing behind all these data. Might it be molecular? Might it be clinically? This is our current EHA president, Elizabeth McIntyre. And we're very proud to have her with us. And with that, I'm done. I'm very much looking forward to your questions and happy to discuss these data. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Martin Reilly, for that wonderful review and updating us right up to ASH this year and all your work at your center. We'll just give you a break of two minutes and give the answer to the quiz to the PGs and then come back to the Q&A session in just two minutes. So I'll just share my screen for that. So the 
quiz that was put to you today was related to two pictures of a 10 year old girl who was admitted with skin patches of three days duration. You were asked to give the diagnosis. That was the first picture. There's a large purpuric lesion. There are some small peripheral lesions. The center of all these lesions is dusky purpura and there's well-defined indurated border and there is a erythematous halo around it. Look at the second picture. Besides the one which was shown to you, what it shows is an umbilicated vesicular lesion. This lesion is of varicella zoster. And of course, you see that purpuric lesion that was shown to you earlier, which is on the left gluteal area. Uh, somehow, majority of you missed this, which gave you the etiology. Uh, large number, we got about 30 to 40 answers related to this as purpura fulminans. Etiology was put as congenital protein C, protein S deficiency. Others have diagnosed this as hairy cell leukemia, cutaneous lymphoma, etc., etc. There's only one person who has picked up this together with this. So the final diagnosis was very cell zoster causing purpura fulminans. It's an acquired condition totally, very well described actually in the literature. And the only correct answer. So there's no question of fastest finger fast. The only correct answer has come from Sri Lanka, Colombo, Dr. Sumali Nutuna. So congratulations, Dr. Sumali, and um, send us your details and we'll send you your price. Congratulations to you. So that was about the quiz and we go to the now question and session. Uh, we begin with Dr. Kripa Bajaj. We'll use the raise hand sign. So if you have a question, please put the sign. Kripa, you start your question. Yes. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful update. Uh, so I have a question, sir. So how, uh, what's your strategy in maintaining, uh, uh, managing patients with TP53 mutation in the front line? So uh, because uh, auto transplantation is not going to give a great benefit to their patients, so how we are going to manage the patients on the front line? Thank you, uh, Kripa. This is a critical question because, to be honest, um, uh, we don't have any alternative so far, at least in Europe, to chemotherapy. Uh, and therefore, it's very important to acknowledge that, yes, also the P53 mutated cases, they still show responses, but normally they are short-term responses. So you achieve remissions, but you really have to very closely watch these patients. And therefore, for these patients nowadays, uh, um, we only do our chemo, uh, uh, but we are very aware and close these patients um, very closely um, to, to e uh, directly switch to targeted approaches. And probably ibrutinib is, uh, I mentioned it, or, or any BTK inhibitor, let's say it that way. I don't want to promote one specific, but that's the only one which is registered in, in, in Europe. Um, uh, so um, you switch to that knowing, I already mentioned that in this high risk cases, a median duration of remission is only in the range of a couple of months, five, six months. You have to already consider then once these patients are relapsing about the next uh, step of treatment. Thank you, sir. And also regarding MRD adapted therapy, which was discussed in low intermediate group. Is it high intermediate group also? We can offer the same type of approach. We very much uh, promote MRD um, as a, uh, which probably is the strongest prognostic marker uh, in, in mantle cell lymphoma. On the other hand, I have to be honest, we routinely approach it or, or perform it in, in clinical trials. We don't perform it outside of clinical trials. Maybe with very few examples after allo transplant. Why is that? Because standard of care is um, patient-specific primers. So it's a very complicated approach. You have to, to um, synthesize specific primers for each individual patient. And therefore, it's not yet prime time in clinical routine. In contrast, I would like to refer to our 
uh, US colleagues, they have established an NGS approach. And uh, again, they only perform it in, in, in studies. But in younger patients, based on MRD status, the MRD negative patients are being randomized between autologous transplant or just our maintenance. So this is a, a very a primary point of, of clinical investigation, but it, it need not make it so far in clinical routine. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, regarding the uh, VR uh, regimen, like which is used in elderly patients, so is there any uh, evidence for using bortezomib maintenance, sir? Because literally what we use for multiple myeloma, is there any evidence for using bortezomib maintenance? There are two studies been, uh, have, uh, which have been performed, one study by our US colleagues and one by the Dutch, and both studies are negative. So bortezomib maintenance is out, full stop. Um, I should also add, if you go for VR cap, I went quickly through the uh, slides and, and this was uh, when uh, performed when there was still the standard regimen, four doses of, of um, bortezomib, if you, uh, day one, four, eight, 11. If you do it that way, you run into problems because thrombocytopenia grade three, four is up to 60, 70%. So if you go for VR cap, and this is how we approach it, only give the first two doses, day one and four. And by that, you split the thrombocytopenia time-wise. The early one is based on bortezomib, but then patients recover, and then the chemotherapy uh, effect sets in. So you don't have the additional thrombocytopenia, then it's much better tolerated. And also add our maintenance. Thank you so much, sir, for the uh, wonderful discussion. Thank you. Dr. Sharan? Thank you, Dr. Martin, for a very lovely talk. Uh, just to query, when you're combining the ibrutinib with the R-chop, are you cutting down on the dose or still keeping it at full dose? And then the other, and the corollary to that is, is there any role for low dose? Because we have issues with cytopenia and, you know, pushing the 560 is a little difficult, you know, in our own practical situation. So your thoughts on that? So there is a small phase one trial which has been performed in, in DLBCL, Anas Junes, though, um, and we were a little bit afraid exactly of that. And therefore, um, we were very cautious, and you might have seen that we only added it up to Archer, but not to our DHAP. Don't add it to our DHAP, then you run into serious problems with uh, essentially thrombocytopenia, which is the major toxicity, also sometimes cutaneous toxicity. Um, and therefore, if you combine it only with our shop or, or only with CHOP or with Benamaste. Uh, but uh, I, we had an, I don't have the full data set so far. It's, it's under investigation. D DSMC knows it, not me, as a PI. Um, but we were very cautious about exactly this, what you re were referring to. And therefore, we had a safety run in where, um, you know, 50 patients were included uh, who were treated with the combination of ibrutinib, and we couldn't detect any uh, enhanced hematotoxicity. Having said that, I'm totally aware that in, you know, it might occur, and therefore, uh, um, I, from my opinion, um, if you have observed that, you, first of all, in elderly patients, you should consider to go to our mini shop. That's one thing you could consider. And secondly, you could also right away move on to the CLL dose of ibrutinib, which is 420. Um, once you run into problem in toxicity, I would reduce it to 280, but I would probably not go below that dose. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Sharat. We'll take some questions from the audience. Many of them are related to P53. Should you do it in all patients? Are you guided by the morphology and KI70? And what is the methodology you use for that? So it all depends on your local um, setup. The easy part, which is probably easy, uh, can be performed worldwide and in each of your institutions is immunohistochemistry. Because cases with P53 mutations, you can detect overexpression 
uh, of uh, P53, and that relates to mutation. So that's the easy approach. Um, standard approach, if, if you're, uh, you know, uh, working in a tertiary center, uh, this is what we're doing in CLL. We check for fish and we also sequence uh, P53, and which is obviously more accurate, fair to say. And if you apply that, you will also see that the um, prognostic impact, and that's different to CLL, the prognostic impact of mutations is stronger than deletions in Montessor lymphoma. So um, these are my recommendations. First of all, and we accept in our studies both, first of all, immunohistochemistry uh, to detect overexpression. Secondly, uh, go for fish. Or, or sequencing if this is established in your institution for um, CLL. Having said that, again, the shortcoming is that so far we are not yet able to individualize first line treatment. Should it be done in all patients or you're guided by the morphology or KI? In the, um, so far, I have to be honest, we don't do it in, in first line because it does not have any consequences, right? We do it in relapsed disease though. Um, in the upcoming WHO classification or the statement of the clinical advisory committee, uh, the wording will be that is yes, it will be recommended in all cases, uh, brackets, if you consider starting a treatment. So similar approach uh, as in CLL, you're not just doing that for fun, you're only doing that once you're starting treatment. And then you have to repeat it again in relapsed disease because uh, this disease might acquire P53 alterations. One more question related to same is, should such patients, if fit, go for allo transplant upfront or even CAR T? This is a tricky question. So um, um, I, I told you that these patients are observed closely. And it's fair to say, if you don't have a real excellent response to induction, we are in, let's say in the younger patients, we don't go for autologous. So because autologous only works uh, uh, in the patients who excellently uh, respond to conventional dose chemotherapy. And therefore, then is the point where previously we considered um, uh, allogeneic transplantation. There are some published data by the British group, but this is retrospectively, and they say it's great. Well, uh, we, we, we have a um, prospective study being performed by, by the German group, Krüger is the first author, and the data are not that great. So it's, it's definitely not standard of care for every Montel cell lymphoma, but in this specific situation, you might consider that. Having said that, there is now available a worldwide consensus of, uh, on the application of CAR T cells versus ELO. And it's interesting, although we have long-term follow-up of ELO transplant, we know we cure some patients. Of course, although this is missing for CAR T cells, still the majority of, of experts recommend it to prefer CAR T cells if that is feasible in your institution. And that's only based on the lower toxicity, full stop. Thank you. Dr. Bhose. Uh, thank you, Dr. Martin, for excellent talk. Uh, similar to P53 situation, so do you recommend or at any time point do NOTCH1, IGH3 mutation, and also uh, SOX11? And uh, does it have any impact on your management decision? Let's start with the easy answer. SOX11, no. Why that? SOX11 is positive for the majority of Montel cell lymphoma, so 90, 95%, and only for the patients uh, with a more indolent feature in the leukemic cases, you sometimes may detect these SOX11 uh, negativity. But it really does not help you because the vast majority of uh, Montel cell lymphoma are SOX positive. Uh, you're right, on, on the schema I showed you, there was also not one, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, but when it comes to clinical application, I think really P53 is uh, the front runner. So you, you, you may already nowadays apply uh, clinically P53. At least this is what we do in our clinical routine. Uh, it's not yet prop 
uh, prime time for notch one, which is much less frequent. And also in the upcoming WHO classification, we were a little bit reluctant uh, to also consider a, co a complex carrier type as a standard molecular risk for these cases. At least it should not yet change treatment in our opinion. And the next question is on the value of uh, platinum. So, uh, for example, your triangle uh, protocol still has RD half, while MCL2 uh, study only had RSA alternating with uh, uh, maxi job. So, uh, you still uh, recommend using platinum, and what's the value of that in, in uh, over and above satarabine? Excellent question. Uh, you know, if you would have asked me 15 years ago, I would say platinum only buys in toxicity. Um, but now I have changed my mind and that's based on a couple and not only me, uh, really a lot of experts and that's based on a lot of, of data sets. The one thing is um, uh, the Scandinavian study group stopped a study with ultra high dose RSC in high risk cell lymphoma because response was too poor. And um, uh, they, their conclusion is that cytarbine alone does not make the job. The same holds up for um, our own study, which I presented at ASH, and in the interest of time, I did not show it here, uh, in relapse disease, which was high dose ROC plus minus bortezomib. Again, bortism has had a benefit in this combination, but uh, the um, comparator arm really performed poorly. So um, saying that high dose RSC alone is not enough, and that is probably why DHEP or even the Italian RBAC is so uh, effective. So we do nowadays consider uh, um, uh, that uh, combination partner is required for RSC. And if you run into problems with toxicity, and, and this is mostly uh, um, kidneys, right? Kidney failure or something like that, then you should consider moving on. And our preferred approach is oxaliplatinum. Um, and that is based also on uh, the favorable toxicity profile, but also on a paper which has been recently published by the French group. Uh, in their study, they allowed either cisplatinum or oxaloplatinum or carboplatinum. And it seems to be in their series, this is not randomized, so I have to take it with a grain of salt that the oxalinum, uh, uh, ox oxaliplatinum uh, um, patients perform best. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Martin. And last question is this uh, utility of bortism. So VR cap nearly doubled overall survival while the study with BR is negative. And uh, uh, the study which you presented last start in relapse setting with uh, cytarabine is also uh, a negative. While the, uh, uh, I think, uh, ECOG study with uh, RCHOP and bortezomib is positive. So why we are getting this conflicting result with the use of uh, bortezomib in mantle cell? Um, no one knows. Uh, is the short answer. Um, I think what... Um, I think th there is something magic about CHOP. No one understands why we are still left with CHOP after 50 years. Uh, um, there seems to be a miracle within it. Uh, and um, Watersmip, if you test it uh, in vitro, it's synergistic with whatever kind of approach. Um, so, uh, and, but this uh, synergism not necessarily translates into clinical synergism. So, um, my short answer is I don't know, but we never use it in combination with uh, Bender Mustin, clearly been said, based on the data you mentioned. Uh, we, we do apply VR cap in elderly patients, uh, VR mini cap. Um, and uh, we also combine it with the R head regimen. But as you were saying, um, uh, yes, uh, there was a small difference, but uh, still, as uh, the, the backbone was so poor, also the combination was not great. I do agree. So, in relapse disease, I think this is really supporting uh, the point that in early relapses, the place for reconsideration of chemotherapy is very limited. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We'll go back to the audience. Again, there are questions on uh, TP53 mutated mental cell lymphoma. 
Uh, one is whether you should quantitate the allele burden. This is taken from the CLL world, where we know that even very small uh, uh, frequency of subclones are sufficient to result in a worse outcome. Um, I would say um, in mantle cell lymphoma, we are not yet there. I should also mention that the frequency of, of P53 alterations in first line is, is probably in the range of whatever, 10% or so, something like that. So it's not that frequent, um, but having said that, um, I would say standard approach, either immunohistochemistry or, or standard sequencing is uh, se uh, sensitive enough. Second part of it is, does autologous transplant benefit TP53 mutated variant? So as mentioned, in, in general, the, um, uh, the outcome is worse, but there are patients who really achieve long-term remissions. Uh, it's a minority of patients, but there are some. And again, therefore, I would really, you know, to, to don't buy in unnecessary toxicity. My decision would be based on the initial response to conventional chemotherapy. If they have an excellent response, go on to autologous. Uh, if not, switch either to allo transplant. In our, probably in our uh, institution, we probably first of all would switch to uh, BTK inhibitors, knowing that is, uh, is already uh, only bridging to a salvage treatment and preparing right away to either uh, CAR T cells or um, allo transplant. Thank you. Dr. Deepankar. Oh, thank you, sir, for this excellent talk. Uh, so I have a patient. Uh, he's a 70-year-old gentleman who was diagnosed with mantle cell lymphoma like in 2016. So at that time, uh, like uh, his KI-67 was around 40% and uh, TP53 mutations were not there. So he was treated with R-CHOP at that time and uh, uh, he was not planning for a transplant. So he was switched to maintenance. So after two years of maintenance therapy, like till 2019, uh, he again uh, had a disease recurrence in the cervical as a cervical lymphadenopathy in 2020. But he was asymptomatic this time. The TP53 mutation was also negative and KI67 is around 40%. So, sir, what should be done? Like now we are repeating the PET scans and he is asymptomatic, but the cervical lymphadenopathy is progressing. No other nodes elsewhere. So, like therapy versus observation or if therapy is there, so like ibrutinib based or chemotherapy followed by transplant. So, so it, it's always difficult to, to, to assume, you know, we are... Zoom or whatever, uh, but uh, I could uh, give you my considerations in general. So first of all, um, QI67 is not that e easy standardized. So you really have to discuss with your local pathologist what's your standard of care. My understanding is that in, in some pathologies, including MD Anderson, which is probably not the smallest uh, pathology worldwide, right? Um, they count also T cells, which are activated in mantle cell lymphoma. And therefore, their, their rates always come higher than what is being measured in Europe. So this is one point. Uh, and to, to, to get a confirmation, I would double check on LDH. A uh, simple thing, very pragmatic. If LDH is normal, I would be a little bit more relaxed. And therefore, I probably, first of all, would just watch and wait in this patients, but closely watching, uh, you said it's only cervical nodes, right? Yes. And, and therefore, um, uh, I probably would just perform an ultrasound and uh, to avoid any, you know, radiation exposure. Once uh, the, well, which is probably not that important for a 70 year old chap. But anyway, um, knowing that um, once the disease is, is progressing or it, it's really major lymph nodes, one has to discuss in this patient individually. If it's only the only manifestation, so excluding also bone marrow, and there I really would consider a bone marrow a biopsy, I would consider radiation. Uh, because it, it's just best tolerated, it's pragmatic, it won't cure the patient, but, but it will give you some time. If in contrast, there's also some, some uh, systemic uh, disease, then my first approach would be a BTK inhibitor. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Dr. Rajan. Thank you, Dr. Martin, for an excellent lecture. 
as you said mental can mimic almost all lymphoid malignancy and there are so many treatment options that we get overwhelmed so most of the questions you have already answered my question is say a young person fit has got a mass sibling donor now what would be your approach from start to and where would you place allogenic so we probably have a similar effect as in CLL, where people said it's standard of care in first line, but then with the advent of uh, ibrutinib or BTK inhibitors in general, with venetoclax, which by the way is also effective in Montesel lymphoma, and I did not discuss that so far, you know, allotransplant is no more standard of care in first line. And I probably would argue it's the same for Montesel. So I would start with standard chemotherapy and once patients are not uh, satisfied not showing a satisfying response then you can consider allotransplant instead of autologous you know only a borderline pr or something like that however these are few patients and otherwise i think allotransplant is still situated in relapse disease and as discussed probably my preferred approach in the high-risk patients, and I should say only in the high-risk patients, based on the three biological risk factors. And then the preferred approach is starting with BTKI. Now, this causes some problem in real life, and really to discuss that. Um, initially, these patients are also responding to this easy treatment, one pill a day, and then you say, well, you have to go on to allotransplant and patients say, why should I? I I'm so well off. And we run into really difficulties to convince the patient because once patients are progressing, then they tend to have a very aggressive disease and it's difficult to catch them uh, as discussed. And in this setting so far, um, because also for CAR T cells, you normally have to bridge them. We probably consider individually venetoclux. Uh, this is again only gives you a couple of months, but this is then really the red traffic light. This is, is your, your warning or the yellow traffic light, your warning signal. Then you have to speed up to go for either allo uh, transplant or CAR T cells. Uh, before autologous, you still recommend that high dose RAC regimen should be there in young patients, or we can do with our chop with the root neighbor, something else. Um, so far, from what I know so far, I would specifically in the high risk uh, patients always add some side arabine, yes because uh, response rate is so much higher. And we did also, you know, I showed you some data on the PFS. We did check for different high risk, lower risk, whatever. And also in high risk patients, there's a significant benefit. So for me, even in younger patients, by the way, um, uh, elderly patients, um, uh, this is, if we do have high QI67, I step away from bendamustine because that does not help you and move to either RCHOP, VR cap, or even high dose RSC in the fit elderly patients. Thank you. Thank you. Going back to the audience, is there anything like cyclin D1 negative mental cell lymphoma? Yes, there is. And I did not mention it because these are very rare cases. And, you know, when this was first published by Fu et al. Uh, about 10-15 years ago, I got a lot of references. And uh, to be honest, in ten, uh, in 9 out of 10 patients, it was not Montesel. It was a different kind of, of lymphoma. So you have to be very much aware. And this is why I said the cornerstone of diagnosis of Montesel lymphoma really is uh, the detection of cyclin D1 overexpression. In these very rare cases uh, uh, who are cyclin D1 negative, what's going on? Well, let's say uh, the sister molecule is being overexpressed, which is cyclin D2 or cyclin D3. Um, but again, these are very rare cases. So be suspicious once people talk about cyclin D1 negative Montesel lymphoma. Thank you. Uh, the other questions are related to rituximab maintenance. One is whether it can be given after BR and second is, what is the duration of rituximab maintenance, two years or three years? <clears throat> uh, there is a formal answer and, and, and the real life answer. The, uh, the formal answer is easy after autologous transplant, only after autologous transplant, it's only three years. Uh, and I, what I did not mention in the data I showed you for RCHOP, this was unlimited rituximab. 
because at that time these were elderly patients uh, age 71 and we thought there is no efficient uh, uh, salvage treatment that was before the advent of btk inhibitors so we really went for uh, unlimited rituximab maintenance and even a comparison to the patients who stopped after two years with maintenance displays that the benefit is better when you're going for unlimited maintenance. However, I have to be honest, um, in real life, so far, I only apply a two-year maintenance. And why is that? I want to be connected somehow to the official registration. And there's another point I should add. Um, I mean, we are living in special days. Uh, this is COVID pandemia, and uh, India is also struck, and we have to adapt our treatment. And when it comes to lymphoma in general, in follicular lymphoma, I discourage rituximab maintenance in elderly patients. Why is that? You can't perform successfully vaccinations. Very clearly been said. In mantle cell lymphoma, it's different. You have a 20% benefit of overall survival. And although COVID is scary, uh, risk of death is not 20%. So that if, if you see the balance, there's still a clear benefit. And therefore, in mantle cell lymphoma, I definitely push for this maintenance, even in the COVID era. And I showed you some data also uh, that after bendamustine, it also does improve overall survival. And again, if I refer to the um, COVID guidelines uh, um, being shared by EHA and ESMO, we discourage it's how it's termed immune suppressive induction in our lymphoma patients. And this is specifically a term for bendamustine, which is very T cell toxic. Thank you, sir. Dr. Abhijit. Hello, sir. Uh... Uh, thank you for such a crisp uh, talk on the mental cell lymphoma. My most of question has already been answered in last uh, with discussion. Only thing, uh, how we monitor the MRD? Like, uh, what are the ways you follow for the MRD in mental cell lymphoma? So um, I already mentioned we don't do it in, 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 in clinical routine. If I would do it in clinical routine, I probably would go for uh, just plain uh, facts analysis. And in principle, we do know it's not efficient enough, but this would be a very pragmatic approach. And once you have, you know, a rise of CD20, CD5 positive cells in the peripheral blood, you definitely know there is some, some preclinical relapse, right? And therefore, uh, there had been already some data and that might be of help for the clinical application if you're only going for two-year um, rituximab maintenance. And then in the follow-up, patients becoming positive, again, based on facts, it's worthwhile to reconsider uh, um, rituximab um, maintenance only, because we do have uh, data some by the Danish group, by the Italian group, that these patients convert again. So this would be a practical approach, how to apply MRD in, in, in daily routine. Yeah, because uh, this ibrutinib you mentioned, after two years, if MRD is negative, we can stop the ibrutinib. Yeah, because to stop the ibrutinib, we definitely, because rituximab, you know, it's like two year maintenance, but to take a call on the stopping ibrutinib. Yeah. I have to caution you. This is uh, this study is hypothesis uh, generating. As, as mentioned, it's it's you know less than fifty patients. It's not randomized. It's patients you normally only would watch and wait. So therefore, yes, data are great, but you have to be. Uh, I, I wouldn't say this is standard of care. I, my point would be a different one. Still, this is promising data. In these very low risk patients, I would only watch and wait nowadays, clearly been said. Uh, but it, it, it does support the approach of BTK inhibitors in first line. Let's say it that way. Thank you, sir. One more question from the audience. Like CLL with richer transformation, is there anything like transformation in mental cell lymphoma? Yes, there, there is. And, and this is, a, um, you know, if one of these three risk factors occurs, 
this is uh, why I said you'd have to double check. And what we do see, in fact, that P53 alterations are more frequent in relapse disease, more in the range of 30, uh, 40%. We do know that ki 67 goes higher and higher. And this effect is especially pronounced in these BTK inhibitors. We don't know why, but in these cases, something is going on that in, if you really apply it in the very late uh, line of, of the disease, you know, uh, you see these patients uh, um, initially responding, but then exploding after three months. And it's a totally different disease. It's ki 67 uh, uh, you know, 90%. Uh, you know, all, most all cells are in cell cycle and it's a totally different disease. And we don't know exactly, there are a lot of papers on this effect, but uh, some describe some molecular alterations, but this answer is not yet, uh, uh, this question is not yet answered for me so far. Thank you. One more question is regarding, in rare cases of allo transplant, post allo transplant, is there any maintenance given? Oops, that's tricky. So far, not. Very simple. Um, uh, based on principal uh, considerations, what are you going to do then? Well, you're a little bit cautious with lenalidomide, which is also registered because you're, you're, you're afraid of GVH, pushing GVH. Um, one thing you could consider is, is ibrutinib. You should know that um, you know it's also in some countries standard of care against GVH. So you don't run into problems. So that is one possible approach. If you see uh, um, a relapse after uh, allotrans, but, but I would not apply it routine-wise. Right. Dr. Akanksha. Good morning, sir. Thank you so much for the excellent update. And uh, most of my queries have been answered, but I'd like to ask you regarding uh, any role of CNS prophylaxis in, in a subset of uh, mantle cell lymphoma patients. And uh, second would be, what is the recent data on the use of acalabrutinib in uh, these patients? Uh, sorry, what was uh, the last question? The recent data the on? recent data on acalabrutinib. Okay, so um, CNS prophylaxis, um, the easy answer is no. Um, we do have uh, more discouraging data lately for DLBCL. So in DLBCL, we only perform it in, in, in our institution, but this is, you know, uh, disputable uh, in, in testis lymphoma and in, in uh, lymphoma with kidney infiltration. Otherwise, no more. And for mantle cell lymphoma, we do know that the risk factors for DLBCL don't hold up. Uh, still, we do know that the cases with blastoid variation with, with um, um, high ki 67 they tend to have um, a higher risk of CNS relapse. Um, but uh, so overall, the, the frequency is probably in the range of 10%, up to 10%, but uh, we don't do it at a, as a routine. So what about acalabrutinib? Um, efficacy wise, and the same holds up for Zanabrutinib, which is I, I, in, in, in Europe and in, and in the US also registered for other entities, uh, it's better tolerated. And there are the specific, uh, um, it's not more efficient, uh, efficacy is quite similar, um, but it's better tolerated and that holds up specifically for uh, respective uh, toxicity of cardiac uh, um, um, arrhythmias, um, atrial fibrillation and secondly bleedings uh, or anticoagulation sorry uh, uh, and uh, therefore um, I would argue in, in these specific patients who are under oral anticoagulation I would consider acalabrutinib I have a gentleman or, or, or a couple of two three gentlemen where they you know this is not such rare uh, um, atrial fibrillation or oral anticoagulation in elderly male in, in, in the western world so in these specific situations, uh, or once patients don't tolerate ibrutinib, I switch to Arcala or Orzonobrutinib. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the one question from audience, Dr. Kanan wants to know, after resistance to ibrutinib, can I add venetoclax and rituximab to ibrutinib or drop ibrutinib totally? This is, uh, well, uh, 
if in the ideal world, yes, I would combine it. Or let's say the other way around. Why was the initial outcome of uh, relapses under ibrutinib so desperate? The reason was that um, patients stopped ibrutinib took a break in treatment and only started salvage treatment uh, three or four weeks later on. And during this time, the disease exploded. That is part of the explanation why the outcome is, is so poor. And therefore, once we now observe a, a, a progression under ibrutinib, we go on with ibrutinib. And only in, in, you know, once we start salvage treatment, we, we, we stop ibrutinib. So, yes, I think overlap is perfect, uh, let's say for a week or so, but then I, I probably would stop ibrutinib. That is my, my practical approach. I think the future will be combination from the beginning on, but we are not yet there. There is a randomized trial comparing ibrutinib versus ibrutinib plus venetoclax, the sympathico trial. And this should probably be read out pretty soon. We pro I, I guess we'll see the data dash, I don't know. Um, but um, that will then pave the, wor uh, the, the, the way to combine treatment. So far, not yet. Thank you, Dr. Shilpa. Thank you, sir. Uh, so I would like to know your experience and uh, your uh, uh, way of management for primary cutaneous uh, mental lymphoma. Um, it's this is a very rare disease if it's only cutaneous, and so my first advice would be to really. Um, exclude systemic involvement because um, mantle cell lymphoma probably should call mantle cell leukemia because it's always all almost always leukemic disease. Secondly, I also would uh, double check the diagnosis that this case really has cyclin D1 overexpression and has the morphology of mantle cell lymphoma. Once this is the case, um, I probably uh, would start with with cautious treatment in that way that I really, because as long as it's not systemic disease, so I would either consider resection or local radiation, something like that, maybe combined with rituximab monotherapy for doses uh, weekly or weekly doses times four, let's say that way. Um, but um, that would be my approach. I'm not aware, I have a mixed experience. So some of these diseases are very aggressive and some of them are more indolent. So I would hope it's, it's the more indolent type, check PI67 and so on and so forth, but starting with uh, probably mostly local treatment, first of all, or smooth treatments like rituximab mono. Thank you. Dr. Varma? Nice talk, Dr. Martin. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to know, in young fit patients, uh, in the initial treatment, would you like to go for uh, RDHAP alone or for four cycles or alternating, uh, you know, arch of RDAP, which will be better? Mm -hmm. um, this is a discussion, ongoing discussion be between our French colleagues and myself. Uh, uh, and what we did, or what I can share with you, we um, uh, compared the Scandinavian regimen, you know, where they uh, start with mega chop and then uh, move on to RRC high dose. We compared that to our regimen, the alternating chop DHAP. And it seems to be that um, efficacy is quite similar and that tolerability is better for the alternating regimen. Uh, and, and it's strange, it sounds strange, but patients really recover during our job, uh, being better prepared for the next RDHAP regimen. And this is my argument also against the four cycles of RDHAP because everyone who, who has treated a patient with relapsed DLBCL, RDHAP is more aggressive if you have, you know, three, four cycles in a row. Um, but yeah, I also would like to refer to, to um, the published data on the French study. It's not well written, but patients who did not show a, a sufficient response to RDHAP, they were switched to our shop. And the majority of them then uh, showed a high quality um, response and only then 
were, um, you know, uh, went on to autologous transplant. So my argument would be that, uh, yes, there is still a role for r -sharp in mantle cell. Thank you, sir. And the, another question is uh, single agent lenalidomide maintenance. Um, we do have uh, the Italian data, uh, data. I did not mention them. Um, um, after autologous transplant, lenalidomide maintenance, similar as multiple myeloma, by the way, uh, um, did show a significant improvement of uh, PFS, not yet overall survival. But these are early days. And these are really convincing data, full stop. 300 patients, randomized, clear-cut data. Well, the problem about lenalidomide maintenance in this setting is uh, a more pronounced hematotoxicity. So toxicity is higher. Well, you say, why does that not occur for multiple myeloma? Well, explanation is simple. Autologous transplant conditioning in multiple myeloma is melphalan only, where it is the full, uh, let's say, beam or, or something like that for mantle cell lymphoma. Um, so, and therefore, I think we do have the registered alternative of rituximab, um, which is better tolerated, where we do also already see an improvement of overall survival. So, I would not, not say it's, it's the question lenalidomide instead of R. So, the question is uh, lenalidomide plus R maintenance. And these are the data I showed you. Thank you, sir. This last question, uh, uh, as you mentioned that uh, P53 mutation is one of the very important, you know, poor prognostic factor. So uh, is there any trial uh, regarding inhibiting P53 or uh, MDM2 inhibition uh, for mental cell lymphoma patients? Um, I'm aware of a couple of, of, of um, mixed back uh, studies, but I'm not aware of any specific mantle cell lymphoma uh, study. And, and I think uh, the one has to be fair, even in the cases with P53 mutations, you have an upfront response rate in the range of 60 to 70%. So it, it's not as desperate in other solid cancers or so. And therefore, the data with Nutlin with other uh, compounds, I think, are um, similar compounds are not that satisfying so far. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Coming back to audience, relapsed mental cell lymphoma. Will you prefer Ibru with rituximab versus Ibrutinib alone? And second question is in rituximab exposed, will you use obinutuzumab? Um, the first question, uh, should we go for Ibru or Ibru R? I probably, um, well, that depends to be honest, uh, on the individual patient. Uh, if it's an early relapse after chemo and or even under R maintenance, I think it does not make sense to add R, simply being said. Um, however, I do have some patients where you really have long-term remissions after R chemo only uh, plus R, and then you might consider to, to add R again. If it's uh, otherwise, I tend to start with Ibru only, and specifically in these uh, pandemic times, clearly been said, we do know that our uh, you know, ongoing R treatment makes the situation much more complicated. Um, and however, I oversee now um, one or two patients where they did show a, a partial response, but not a very good response to I. And I think in these situations, you might consider to add R. But upfront, I would prefer iobotinic monotherapy. Any place for obinutuzumab? Um, this is uh, unfortunately showing we are living in the world of capitalism. And um, unfortunately, the company decided not to go on this path. I think there are clear indications that obinutuzumab is more efficient than rituximab, also in mantle cell lymphoma. But as mentioned, uh, the company decided it uh, not to label for uh, mantle cell lymphoma, and therefore we don't do it in clinical routine. And, for, and, and they de even don't provide it anymore for clinical trials. It's, it's uh, unfortunately. Right, sir. Uh, one question is about rare case of CNS disease in a young fit MCL upfront. What will be your protocol? Paul, that's, these are really the, the hard nuts to crack. I mean, there's no, no, no clear answer. So um, 
it depends on the individual situation. Let's say if it's predominant uh, seen as a manifestation, um, then I probably go for an old fashioned metothrexate systemic disease uh, treatment. And you know, in Europe, we have this standard matrix uh, protocol adding thiotipa, which is an alkanating drug, and RRC, which also works for Montessor lymphoma. So I would probably go in the fit younger for something like metrics um, for the elderly and i mentioned already it, it's sometimes occurring in the um and by the way the metrics uh, protocol also includes autologous transplant i should add that um, for the elderly patients um, and normally it occurs in relapse disease then you're lucky because um, with ibrutinib you get uh, to have a, a well tolerated approach um, which really works in these patients. Um, and um, you have to be aware, normally these are high-risk patients. Uh, they have aggressive features, high QI67, and so on and so forth. So in these patients individually, then you might consider also to prepare the next step of treatment. And obviously, in LLA patients, allotransplant is not possible. So in these patients, you would go on for, for um, a CAR T cell. Thank you, sir. Dr. Kunga? Excellent lecture, sir. Most of my queries have been answered. But I just want to ask one more question, sir. Suppose the mental cell lymphoma presents as complex karyotype, com presents with complex karyotype. Can we give, in the frontline therapy, can we give BTK inhibitors along with rituximab? Um, we in Germany can't because it's off-label. Um, and I do think that complex karyotype is a negative prognostic factor in mantle cell lymphoma. Just to, to allude to that, it, it's not that rare. We, we you know, whatever, um, I think now almost uh, 30 years ago, we published a paper showing that uh, a mantle cell lymphoma is the disease with the most complex karyotype of all kinds of lymphoma maybe with the exception of Hodgkin. Um, so uh, it's, it's not that rare. Uh, it's more standard in Montessor lymphoma that these cases do have, or no, maybe not standard, but uh, this is highly overlapping with the known high risk factors like P53 and so on and so forth. So um, I, if you have a case with with uh, you know these complex karyotypes, your chances are very high that these uh, cases are blastoid, uh, p53 mutated anyway, uh, and or high ki67. And as mentioned, so far, um, ibrutinib is not registered in, in, in Europe, but once it's based on the shine trial, will be registered. Yes, um, in these high risk cases, I would go for the combination chemo plus I. Another question, sir. Supposedly one patient presents as mental cell leukemia. So what will be your approach? Uh, mental cell leukemia is, is simple because essentially all mental cell lymphoma is mental cell leukemia. So um, all of them do have leukemic generalization and this is not necessarily a sign of high risk disease. However, there is this, uh, you're right, there's, uh, there's cases with blastoid cells in the peripheral blood yes. uh, with high LDH and, and so on and so forth. And yes, this is, is, is a high risk disease, uh, but leukemic uh, presentation per se is, is not a high risk uh, feature of mantle cell lymphoma, but is more the, at least in the Western world, the most frequent presentation. Only when it's blastoid, then or then decide is blastoid or high LDH, right? Thank you. One last question from the audience before Dr. Abhishek: How do you treat stage one MCL with KI67 of over thirty percent? Yeah, th these are the the cases where we always discuss. And you can discuss it all through, well, you can do whatever you want, let's say. Um, there is no clear-cut data. Um, it always depends on the individual patient. Uh, um, so once, uh, let's say, you have a younger patient, and it's not only a one-centimeter lymph node, but it, it's, you know, whatever, uh, three times five centimeters, then I probably would go for... for um, 
either a full induction or what we tend to do then we we do uh, uh, give three or four cycles of induction shortens induction not going to autologous in case of good response but instead of uh, uh, local uh, consolidation by radiation if it's an elderly patient, you know, and this is, you know, then frequently the case, you know, whatever 71 year old gentleman with comorbidities, um, then again, if it's only a, a small lymph node, I only would go for, for um, radiation just because of better tolerability. If it's larger lymph nodes, then we also tend to go for shortened induction based on high ki 67 then I would probably go for three cycles of our chop or even our mini chop and then uh, radiation consolidation. But again, this is always very individual. And in our guidelines, we recommend systemic, shortened systemic treatment followed by radiation consolidation. Thanks. One last question now, Dr. Abhishek. Well, thank you for your talk. Uh, young patients, sir, we are sorted. We know we need to go aggressive. It is the elderly where we are struggling. And most of these guys are elderly. Very tempting to use the newer regime, sir. IR or your rituximab with ibrutinib or your ibrutinib with benitoclax. Uh, problem comes. Uh, we have tried it in a few patients. It does very well. The problem comes, what do you do after that? For In a country like India, we don't have CAR-T. You can't do an auto we are left with the uh, thinking as to what should be the next regime then after a IR or a ibrutinib venetoclax. So if uh, if you have these relapses after um, later application of ibrutinib, right in in second, third, fourth line, so then possibly. I think no, no, no. I, I got that. I, I just wanted to explain you. Yeah. Then I think it does not make sense to re-challenge with chemotherapy. Now, this might be different, and we just don't know when you start with ibrutinib, as you were referring to in first line, and I fully agree with you, and my understanding of the published data by the MD Anderson by, by the Barcelona group is that these cases tend to be more aggressive. So, therefore, I really would push for a re-biopsy in these cases to, to re-investigate whether it's a high risk uh, profile. If it's a low risk profile, I, I think I still would just try standard chemotherapy. If it's a high risk profile, uh, which is more frequently the case, and, and you were referring to elderly patients and there you can't go for a very aggressive treatment, then you're left with options like our mini chop or so. Based on the data I am aware of, with lenalidomide monotherapy, for example, response rate is only around 10%, 30% in combinations, which is not great. Um, so essentially, uh, it all de uh, depends on the features of the patients. If, if you know, CAR T cells has also only been applicable in the fit younger patients, uh, fit older patients. So uh, in this specific situation, I would tailor. Uh, uh, just standard our chemo uh, according to the general performance status of the patient and to the uh, molecular risk factor of the disease. This is not a great answer, I know, uh, but this is probably what I would try. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Abhishek. Uh, official vote of thanks will be given uh, by Dr. Mr. Ashish Kumar, but before that, on my behalf, on behalf of Mumbai Hematology Group, all my colleagues over here, we are extremely grateful to you, Dr. Martin Trading, for sparing your two hours. Um, I know how difficult it would have been for you, but you spared that time and educated this part of the world. It's not only India, but we have almost 15 surrounding countries from where the youngsters and the consultants have listened to you today. And the care of mental cell lymphoma will be markedly improved from tomorrow. Uh, over to Mr. Ashish. Thank you, uh, sir. Uh, we at Zyrus sincerely thank MHG and Dr. M. Agarwal for giving us this opportunity to support today's webinar. I thank Dr. Martin for his great session today through his session highlighting the recent updates in mental cell lymphoma. At the end of his session, he also shared how he considered five years from now, MCL would be treated and uh, it's a very, very insightful session. Uh, thanks to you for also patiently answering questions for over the last uh, half an hour or so. Thank you so much, sir. I thank chief guest of today evening, Padam Shri, Dr. Pankaj Shah, who highlighted the importance of such digital initiatives in keeping abreast with latest updates by connecting to the experts across the globe. 
Congratulations to the uh, winner of quiz from Colombo today. Thanks to all the eminent faculty for a wonderful discussion. And not to forget our respected virtual delegates, delegates who joined us today from India and across the globe. I once again thank Professor Dr. M. B. Agrawal for his untiring efforts to create such platforms to improve hematology care in our country and now across the world. Uh, Dr. Pankaj has said he has started a university uh, and it's up to clinicians to take most from this university. So, sir, keep the university going in. It's benefiting so many clinicians. With that, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, have your uh, great Sunday ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, thank you, Mr. Ashish, and thank you, Dr. Tari. Bye-bye. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Bye-bye.